Okay, welcome back everybody to CS162. Believe it or not, this is our last lecture of the term. Uh, it's pretty hard to believe that this term is over already, but uh, it's been uh, rushing by and um, I guess we've re reached the end. Today we're gonna pick up uh, where we were left off uh, last week. We were talking about distributed storage and then we're gonna go on to talking about key value stores and CORD in particular as an algorithm uh, for storing key value stores. And if you recall, um, we were uh, also talking about TCP last time, and we were talking about the congestion avoidance algorithm. And uh, the congestion avoidance algorithm is uh, really the thing that makes TCP a good citizen style algorithm uh, as opposed to UDP. And it, we're gonna try to pick an amount of outstanding data uh, in the network that we're gonna put out there before we hear about from ACTS and uh, to try to ov avoid overloading the network. Um, while at the same time basically trying to maximize our pipelining. And the assumption here is that most of the data loss is caused by overloading. Uh, most of our links that uh, packets go over are pretty reliable and they very rarely lose any data. And so really the loss is because too many clients are sending data through some node in the middle of the network and that node basically starts having to drop packets because uh, there's not enough buffer space. So this is really a question of the sender's window size. Uh, the window size is the amount of data that a sender has outstanding uh, in bytes before it receives an ACK. And we're gonna adjust that to try to uh, maximize our pipelining while avoiding uh, congestion. And this sender's window size has to be larger than the receiver's window size, because if we have too much data outstanding and uh, the receiver can't forward any data to its uh, applications, then we, the receiver would have to stop, uh, start dropping packets and that would be very unfortunate. So what we're gonna do is try to match the rate of sending packets with the rate that the slowest link can accommodate that. And so the sender is using an adaptive algorithm, we talked about that, to decide the window size. And the goal is basically to fill the network between the sender and the receiver uh, with data and the basic technique is to slowly increase the size of our window until the acknowledgement starts uh, being delayed or lost. And at that point, we know that we have too much data in the network. So as an example, uh, which I didn't mention last time explicitly, is how much data do we want in the network barring congestion? What we want is we would like if we knew what the round trip latency was, the time for data to go to the destination and come back, we would like the round trip latency times the bandwidth of the slowest link to represent the amount of data in the network and uh, that uh, we're putting out there. And so we want it really to be that the ACK arrives just as we are about to send the next packet and that we have all the maximum uh, amount of data outstanding, okay? And uh, so for instance, you, you know, if you've got uh, 100 millisecond uh, round trip time, then uh, you take 100 milliseconds times the bandwidth of the slowest link, and that's gonna give you an amount of data um, that is uh, supposedly outstanding. Now we have a question here of, uh, is the window size a limit on the number of packets that we receive? So the answer there is no, it's not packets, it's about data, um, total data in bytes, okay? If you remember, the uh, TCP is a stream-based algorithm, and so it's, uh, making its decisions based on the number of bytes that have been sent and not on the number of packets. And uh, that's basically the acts are, are based on uh, what byte has been received at the destination. Okay. And there's another question here of when talking about bandwidth in general for TCP, are headers included in the bandwidth? So um, in fact, the headers are included in the bandwidth because they are overhead. Uh, you can think of headers as uh, providing basically a um, overhead that gives you an effective bandwidth uh, for transmitting the actual data that's a little lower than the uh, maximum bandwidth of the bits being transmitted. And um, so we need to take that into account when we're doing this calculation for window size because the data in the windows is just uh, on either end is, is data, it's not uh, packet headers. Okay. So the TCP solution we mentioned was called slow start, which is you start sl sending slowly and you keep increasing the window size by one uh, for every successfully received ACK. And then when you um, start losing packets, uh, then you back off by dividing by two. And that gives the classic sawtooth uh, behavior of uh, the amount of data that TCP puts into the network. We call this additive increase multiplicative decrease. <clears throat> 
So the other thing we talked about was CAP theorem. And the CAP theorem, as I mentioned before, was a, uh, really a hypothesis or speculation on the part of Eric Brewer uh, here at Berkeley back in the early 2000s, which um, he basically said that you can have consistency, availability, partition tolerance are all properties of storage systems in the network. And the CAP theorem says you can have two of these, uh, but not three. Okay, and so the simplest one to keep it uh, in mind is basically, uh, for instance, if you have consistency and availability, but not partition tolerance, what that says is, as long as you never have any breaks in the network, then uh, you can always be available, clearly, because you can always route to wherever your data is being stored, and it can always be consistent because uh, you are basically can always make sure that when you update the data, everybody who uh, is reading it gets updated. Okay, and so this is called Brewer's theorem. It was originally conjecture, as I mentioned, and then there was uh, uh, some uh, 10 years ago or whatever, there was a, uh, a call for proposals for papers that about the CAP theorem and uh, a number of different theoretical papers appeared, all with slightly different uh, assumptions, thereby, thereby leading to slightly different theorems. But anyway, by and large, it's true, and it's a, an important thing to keep in mind when we're looking at distributed systems. So back to consistency again. So we were talking about the, the uh, network file system, NFS, which is one of the longest uh, and, and most popular file systems over the years. It was originally by Sun Microsystems. And uh, the protocol here is one of weak consistency. Uh, the client polls server periodically to check for changes. And it pulls the server if the data hasn't been checked in the last three to 30 seconds. And uh, as a result, when a file is changed on one client, the server might be notified quickly, but other clients will continue to use old versions of blocks until a timeout. And so we kind of showed this situation where there are two clients. Uh, cl the first client there at the top left has um, an old version, V1 of the data. The second client has written that data. So it's got V2 and that's already gone back to the server. And so the server has the most up-to-date value. And uh, what happens is a, a polling every now and then, the top client there says, gee, is F1 still OK? So it's going to ask questions about the uh, file attribute metadata. And the server says, no, it's I got a new updated version, in which case the, class, the client gets the updated version and um, will eventually see updated data. Now, I will point out that this, uh, these updates are on a per block basis, or 4K, which isn't necessarily the um, the data that the clients are caring about. So that's an issue, all right? It's, uh, it's possible that the records that the clients are storing in the files um, on a byte basis span a block or whatever. And so as a result, this consistency is not only a little delayed, but it also may show sort of partially updated objects, which can be a problem. Um, and so in this scenario, with if multiple clients are simultaneously writing to the same file, in NFS, you can get um, different versions of blocks, and you can get basically uh, inconsistent information. And so that led us to the sequential ordering constraints, which we were talking about, which is sort of what sort of cache co coherence might we expect from a system like this? Um, for instance, if one CPU changes a file, uh, and before it's done, another CPU reads a file, might, what might we see? And so here we have a scenario with three clients. And what you can see here is a situation where we start out with the file content uh, version A and all the blocks. And so client one is busy reading, and they get A in this uh, time frame, and then they write B. And meanwhile, client two starts reading. And so they're reading in a period of time that's somewhat overlapping those two writes. And so in this case, uh, client two might get partially A and partially B. And then it might write C. And so when client one goes back to look at the data, it might get some weird combination of B and C. And client three might get some combination of B or C in here as well. So this is um, potentially very scrambled consistency. And you might ask the question of what you'd actually want. And uh, assuming, for instance, one option might be that we want the system to behave exactly the same way as if all three of these clients were really processes on the same physical node. And what that would mean is that if a read finishes before the write starts, you get the old copy. If the read starts uh, after the write finishes, you get the new copy. And otherwise, you get something in between. 
that's almost what we've gotten here, but there's a little delay on this, you know, three to 30 seconds. And so that, uh, that delay is, can add some uh, kind of strange effects if you're not careful, okay? And so um, for NFS, basically, if the read starts more than 30 seconds after the write, you get a new copy. Uh, otherwise, you could get some combination of partial updates. So what can we do about this to get something a little more consistent? So there was another file system, the Andrew file system, um, that was later than the original NFS. And um, by the way, the NFS uh, came in several different uh, versions. There's version one, two, three, four, all of it sort of changed some of these semantics a little bit to give you uh, better control over the consistency of the data, but it's still a weakly consistent model. So in the Andrew file system, uh, they uh, adopted a callback model where the server keeps track of everybody who has a copy of a file. And when there are changes that happen, the server immediately tells everybody that there's uh, been a change. And as a result, the clients that are get this information from the server can go ahead and uh, invalidate the data and uh, from their caches and thereby know that they've got the most up-to-date data. So what's good about this idea is there's no polling bandwidth. So um, in the NFS file system, you have to keep polling over and over again. And so if you have many, many clients, the polling bandwidth can be exorbitant on the server. In the Andrew file system, there's only traffic when, uh, to the clients that actually have to know about a change to a particular file, okay? And um, the downside though, is that we've changed our, our stateless model which is what we had originally with NFS, where the server didn't have to know anything about the clients, to a stateful model where the server has to keep track of uh, which clients have which files. Okay, and um, the down, you know, that means that basically if the server crashes and come back comes back up, it has to query all of the clients out there to find out um, what files they have cached so that it can get its callback set up again. Now the other thing, so that takes care of the polling bandwidth of NFS. The other thing that uh, the Andrew file system deals with is this write through on close, which uh, gives it better semantics for updates. And so the idea here is that when you open a file in the Andrew file system, you get a, a snapshot of the file at the time that you opened, and uh, you continue to read a completely consistent version of the file, even as uh, other uh, clients are writing that file, it isn't until you close the file and reopen that you get to hear about writes. And furthermore, uh, clients that are writing data will um, not actually propagate that data to the server until they've closed the file again. And so as a result, the writes are a com uh, completely consistent set of writes to the file are propagated to the server all as uh, one grouping. Okay, and so we have session level semantics. We up, updates are visible to other clients only after the file is closed. And uh, so you don't get partial writes as I was uh, talking about with NFS. It's really all or nothing. And um, so that's, uh, that's different semantics in NFS and it's much cleaner. So in AFS, basically everyone who has a file open continues to see an old version. You could think of it as a snapshot or a slightly uh, outdated version if you like, but it's a fully consistent one and you don't get any newer versions until you uh, reopen the file. So uh, the other thing that Andrew file system did was um, data is cached in the local disk of the client as well as in memory. So NFS basically used the buffer cache for, for um, caching data. And so as a result, it was of limited size, whereas the uh, AFS file system can basically cache files entirely in the local disk, and so it can have a much larger cache. And um, you know, when you open with a cache miss, basically the file's not on the local disk, you get the file from the server, you set up callbacks with the server. When you write, followed by a close, at that point you send your uh, updated consistent copy back to the server and it tells basically all clients with copies to fetch new versions from the server. Uh, if the server crashes, you lose all the callback state and end up reconstructing that callback information from the client, which basically means you have to ask every client uh, which files it has cached. Now this callback uh, process, by the way, doesn't have to uh, be used on read-only file partitions. So in the case of a read-only file partition, um, in that case, uh, we don't, nobody's gonna be updating it, and so we can cache 
uh, pretty much all of the files we wish in a read-only um, partition and uh, the server doesn't have to keep track of callbacks because it doesn't actually have to you know, relay any changes. It's a read-only partition. Okay, so the pros of AFS relative to NFS is less server load, so the clients are not polling all the time like they were in NFS. Uh, and furthermore, the disk is the is a cache, and so you have many more files can be cached locally. Uh, callbacks basically means that the server is only involved in communication between clients when there's actual information to be uh, forwarded, namely a file that client A is updating is being uh, looked at or cached by file B, uh, by client B, I mean. So um, that's the... Uh, positives there of that callback system. For both AFS and NFS, however, the central server is a bottleneck. Uh, it's a performance bottleneck, so all writes have to go through the server in both cases. Uh, cache misses have to go through the server. Um, there's an availability thing here that if the server uh, goes down, it's a single point of failure in this system, and so all of a sudden, uh, everybody who was using uh, some files basically can no longer use them. Uh, or communicate changes between each other because the server is that central point. Uh, and so the server machines uh, ends up having a relatively high cost relative to the workstations because it needs to be beefier in both cases to handle all that traffic. So that kind of leads us to a question of can we do better? And um, can we do something a little bit different that, um, that uh, doesn't sort of focus so much of the performance and reliability on a single system. And uh, maybe to do that, we might consider changing our model a little bit. So what about sharing data rather than files? So up till now, we've been talking about files uh, just like a regular file system. So they're sort of bags of bits, uh, groups of bits that have names that are in some namespace, um, the hierarchical namespace starting from a root file system and working its way down. And um, we think of files as uh, streams of bytes that we can open, we can modify things in the middle, we can close them, et cetera. And perhaps by changing the semantics of what we want to deal with for our data, we might be able to do something larger. Okay, and so what we're gonna think about instead is key value stores. And a key value store is pretty much used everywhere uh, you know, there are lots of languages that you're used to, Perl, Python, Go, um, C Sharp, all of these different languages that essentially have associative arrays in them where uh, your key can be an arbitrary string and you can say sort of array indexed by string equals an arbitrary value. And as a result, the, um, you know, as a result, you can then get it later by, by uh, indexing the array with that key. All right. Now, um, the question uh, we have here is, is this um, somewhat like JSON? So it, it's, um, so JSON is a serialization uh, language for objects. And so in a key value store, you could take a JSON value uh, object and, and store it as the value in a key value store. So you could do that with it. And so rather than thinking about a shared distributed file system, perhaps we want to think about a shared distributed key value store um, and use that instead of uh, message passing or file sharing as our communication mechanism. Okay. And then um, once we think of that, the question will be, can we make it scalable and reliable? And that's going to be the rest of this lecture today. So just to uh, emphasize this a little bit, the key value store is an extremely simple inter interface relative to a file system. So we have two operations, put and get. So put takes a key and a value and it inserts it into the key value store. Get takes a key and it retrieves the value associated with that. And notice that um, we've abstracted away uh, the, this to its uh, simplest operations put in get. I'm not even talking about an array index here. Um, we're just talking about puts and gets. Okay. And why do we go for a key value store? Well, the thing is that this particular interface is simple enough that it's going to be very easy to scale. And I'm going to show you how we do that as we go on with the lecture. It can handle huge volumes of data, like petabytes, for instance. Um, 
you can uh, distribute the items uh, easily and, and uh, partition them across a bunch of storage. Um, it has very simple consistency properties because we can talk about the latest uh, value associated with a given key. And it's um, a simpler, more scalable database for a lot of applications that uh, only need key value store. So you can think of a key value store like a table uh, that's indexed off of the key that has a single column in it uh, other than the key. And um, many applications, and a surprisingly large number of applications, that's more than enough to uh, perform their activities. And just so you know, there are many examples of key value stores out there. So um, Amazon, uh, has, for instance, for instance, a key value store where the key might be the customer ID and the value might be all sorts of stuff associated with the customer profile, buying history, credit card, current cart values, et cetera. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, the key might be a user ID and the value might be user profiles again. Um, iCloud and iTunes, the key could be a movie or a song name and the value a movie or a song. So key value stores are pretty general and they're used by a lot of uh, cloud level systems that you're familiar with. Just to be a little more, dive in on this just a little bit more. So Amazon, for instance, has uh, the Dynamo uh, DB, which is an internal key value store to power Amazon's shopping cart. And they also have a the simple storage system or S3 that's uh, is a key value store as well. We're going to talk, uh, when we talk about the cord algorithm, we're going to talk about um, sort of the underpinnings of the Dynamo DB in just a little bit. Um, at Google, we have Bigtable and HBase and Hypertable, which is all distributed, scalable data storage ex examples. We have Cassandra, which is uh, a distributed data management systems, also a key value store, kind of like Cord that we're going to talk about. Um, then there's Memcached and eDonkey, eMule. These are a whole bunch of key value stores that are used for large distributed systems. So this is a, a f fairly powerful API and can be implemented in lots of different ways. And let's explore this a little bit. So the basic idea here is taking your idea of a hash table, which you're well aware of, and distributing it. So what does distributed mean here? Well, the main idea is after we've simplified the storage interface to put in get, then we are going to partition our uh, keys and values across many machines. And so one option might be we partition the chunks of the key space and um, send ranges of the key space to different machines. And the uh, tricky part about this is going to be then uh, once, once we're, uh, we've done this, now how do we figure out where our data is stored? And so once we've distributed this, we have to start worrying about uh, finding the data afterwards. OK, and some challenges, for instance, are scalability. So we would like to scale to thousands of machines. Or, or hundreds of thousands of machines. We would like to scale the petabytes of storage, um, so huge amounts of storage. And um, we also need to deal with fault tolerance. So what happens if one of our storage nodes fails? Okay, then what? Um, there's, a, there's a question on the chat here. Uh, when we talk about uh, nodes, are we talking about uh, basically storage devices? And the answer is, well, we're actually talking about typically a um, a complete uh, chunk of a machine with um, a lot of disk, of course, because it's a storage node, but also it needs to have CPU and a network uh, interface so that it can participate in the protocols we're going to talk about. So these are more than just storage devices. These are, um, these are actual complete machines just with a lot of storage. Okay? So in terms of fault tolerance, we're going to need to figure out how to handle machine failures, with, failures without losing our data without degrading performance. Um, we're going to need to think about consistency. So uh, for instance, if we have uh, multiple copies of data and we have multiple clients writing at the same time, how do we come up with some consistency model that's usable? And this uh, harkens back a little bit to what we were talking about with NFS and the fact that um, we had this uh, kind of strange situation where we could have some updates that we saw and others that we didn't and we end up with a, a strangely inconsistent file. And then also we need to deal with heterogeneity. Now heterogeneity is something that you probably don't haven't thought of much before um, if you haven't thought about deploying something that's going to be around for for months and years. 
And it's sort of arises in the following way. Suppose that you buy 100 machines for your machine room, uh, and you are going to use them for this key value store. And then um, you start incrementally scaling. And so you want to buy, you know, in three months, you want to buy 10 more machines. And then you buy another 100 machines and so on. And these machines are going to vary in capability. They're probably going to get larger over time. And um, so as a result, whatever system we build here, uh, as we're adding individual machines, we're going to want to make sure that uh, we can deal with the fact that uh, the machines in the system are not all identical. Okay, so that's going to be an interesting challenge. So some questions here that come up is, okay, so for put with our key value, uh, where do you store a new key? Now this, uh, the where here is an interesting one, right? Because if we're talking about distributing the data widely over hundreds or thousands of nodes or 100,000 nodes, uh, this question of how to actually find the results is is complicated and it's going to be part of how we come up with an actual algorithm that produces a storage system for us. And, um, and then once we've figured out a where, and by the way, another aspect of where is if we're stay keeping multiple copies, we have to figure out kind of where to put more than one copy. And, and so then when we want to do get, we're going to have to figure out where to get the value we want. Okay, and so this where aspect is going to be important for us. And of course, we want to do those above things while still providing scalability, fault tolerance, consistency, et cetera. Okay. So how do we solve this where question? Well, the simple answer, this is the answer you give to somebody, you jump in the elevator and they say, how do I solve where in a key value store? You can say hashing, right? But hashing is, is only really the beginnings of the solution. So as you know about hashing in a hash table, whatever, is you take a key space, which might be large. For instance, our typical key spaces these days are uh, M bits, where M might be 256. And you run a hash over your data to give you a 256-bit key. And now the you know that 256-bit key, uh, the hash is going to tell us where to put that data. So if we had 10 nodes and we hashed our key, it might give us one of 10 different nodes to put things at. And that would be you know, a hash table that you build in software, learned about in 61B. But uh, in our distributed networking situation, we have something much more complicated. Uh, what if we don't know where all the nodes are or who all the nodes are? Like, because nodes are at, coming online over time or uh, exiting because they've died and need to be rebooted or they're being decommissioned. So you know, perhaps they come and go, which means that basically this hashing uh, from the key space to a location needs to be much more dynamic than a typical hash table that you're used to. Um, and then of course, what if some keys are really popular? Uh, the simple hashing algorithm would just put sort of pick one location for every key, but perhaps a really popular key, we would like to pick a bunch of different locations and as a result, uh, pick up some of that um, hotspot behavior for keys by putting spreading you know copies over multiple nodes. So this this hashing is really just the beginnings of the answer, and we need to do something stronger than that, okay, or more dynamic. And then of course lookup comes into play. So you know whatever lookup we come up with, the simple idea that well we hash to figure out where the location is, and then we lo we store that location in some directory. Uh, won't that directory become a bottleneck? And uh, that could be a problem. So we're going to need to solve these problems. So let's do this in steps. So we're going to start by not worrying about this uh, directory being a single point of failure and performance uh, for the moment. And just assume we do have a, a directory, which helps us map from key to what node is storing it. Okay, so for instance, uh, here a client is sending in a message that wants to put key 14 uh, with value 14, and it sends to the directory. And what does the directory do? It says, well, um, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you where to store this, but I'm, first I'm going to record the fact that I've decided that key 14 is going to go on node 3. And so as a result, it's going to forward your put query to node 3. And uh, 
as a result, there will be an acknowledgement that will come back. And um, node 3 now has the mapping between key 14 and value 14. And the directory keeps track of the fact that key 14 is on node 3. Why do we do that? Well, um, now you know the get goes to the directory, and the directory can say, well, I know where key 14 is. I'll forward you to the node. And then the node gives the result back to the directory and forwards that back to the client, and we're good to go. All right. Now, um, this slide here talks about the recursive directory architecture we're talking about. We call this recursive because essentially we're treating this like a, uh, a routing problem that's recursive in its nature. So for instance, in this get example, we, uh, we send the get to the master, and then the master figures out what the next hop is and recursively sends it on to the next hop. And so this routing idea that we route through the directory to the destination and then from the destination back to the client is what we call recursive. Uh, the alternative here is iterative, and that would be uh, one in which the, uh, the original put query goes to the directory, and the directory says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put uh, key 14 on node 3, but it goes back and it tells the client about this, node 3. And so now node th the client basically says, oh, asks node 3, could you please uh, go ahead and put key 14 for me, and uh, that happens. And so this is iterative because we... We, we do each step one at a time. We first find out where to store the data, and then we, find, and then we go ahead and put it there. Okay? And of course, the iterative idea works also for the get operation. So we get, you know, where is K14? The master directory says, look for node 3. And then we come down, um, you know, and we said, you know, ask node 3, can you give me K14? And that point, it returns the value. Okay? So this difference between um, iterative and recursive is, um, is an interesting one. And it's really a choice of implementation rather than anything too profound. So on the left here, we have the iterative, excuse me, on the left, we have the recursive version that I told you earlier. And so here, um, that's really like routing where we forward through each hop to the destination and it gets forwarded through. Whereas again, recursive is the client keeps asking um, the next step uh, for its information, and it's, it's making all the requests on its own. It asks the directory, then it asks the node, and so on. And so the advantages of the recursive case is it's faster, uh, since um, the directory server might be closer to the storage nodes, and we're essentially forwarding through and back uh, with as short a path as possible. And it's also easier for consistency. Okay, and so the reason it's easier for consistency is if we have multiple clients that are all updating simultaneously, the directory is going to help us with that by, um, uh, by kind of keeping uh, tabs on how many things are currently outstanding. And so maybe it can make sure that we keep a consistent value. Okay, the downside is the directory can quickly become a bottleneck in this scenario. The iterative one is much more scalable because every client can do its own querying, okay? And so you can have many clients using bandwidth throughout the network. Uh, does, not all that bandwidth has to route through the, the directory. The downside is it's a little harder to enforce consistency because now each client is doing its own thing and so there's much less control over when updates happen to a given value, okay? Now, uh, oops, I'm having some issues here with my mouse. Uh, hold on one second here, okay? I'm going to uh, start over, restart something. Okay, so as we were talking um, before our, uh, and, um, the, the question here was, uh, why is it that um, iterative is harder to keep consistent uh, the good the question for that is pretty simple. It's basically that uh, if every client is all doing this on their own, it's much harder for them to coordinate and make sure that there's only one uh, latest version of the items. Whereas if the master directory is coordinating, then um, then it can kind of know all the ongoing updates and it can uh, make things work out properly. So uh, now the question here. Um, in the 
is really, if you look at this clearly, how do we make this scalable? Well, we can add nodes. That doesn't seem like a big deal. But uh, dealing with this directory seems a little tricky. OK, so for storage, we'd like to just add nodes to scale things arbitrarily. We'd like to be able to make sure that a number of our requests uh, can serve requests from all the nodes um, where a value is stored in parallel. So just like with the RAID, uh, you know, RAID 1 or RAID 5, whatever, the, the way you get more bandwidth is by finding all the places, particularly for RAID 1, where there are multiple replicas and being able to serve reads from those. OK, and so that'd be nice if we could do. Um, the master can basically replicate popular items on more nodes, but now we have to worry a little bit about the, uh, the master um, directory basically getting overloaded. So uh, how do we make it more scalable? Well, we could replicate it, so there's multiple identical, identical copies of the directory, but um, you know, how do we make that work properly? We can partition it so that we could basically figure out how different directories store different parts of the key space, but how do we do that, okay? And so it's, you know, it seems like we can almost get our goals of scalability just by adding nodes here, but the directory gets in the way. And so we're gonna need to come up with a good real way of dealing with that, okay? So how do we deal, uh, among other things, with fault tolerance? So as I mentioned, as you put more nodes in the system, your rate of overall failure is going to go up. And so in the, at the same time that we're adding nodes to the system, we're also going to want to deal with full tolerance, possibly by replicating the value on several nodes. OK? And uh, maybe we'll place replicas on different racks in a data center or different uh, data centers in the country or different continents. There's lots of different types of uh, replication we might want to do, and we need to figure out how to do that. So for instance, here we could have uh, our put that we saw earlier where we're putting key 14 with value 14 and uh, and then the directory might say well send it to node 1 and node 3 at which point we send uh, multiple copies and um, of course you can have different combinations of iterative and recursive and so on uh, involved in that but um, so multiple replicas do seem like a way to get full tolerance but now we've even made things more complicated in that the directory has to keep track of all the places where the copies are. And there's also this consistency question, which kind of shows up when we have more than one node that's writing and we have multiple replicas. Now all of a sudden we've got sort of some complexity. Okay, so how do we know that a value has been replicated properly on every node? So if we've got thousands of nodes in the system and uh, We've, we're trying to write three replicas. How do we even know that all three of them have been written? Well, maybe we wait. Uh, but then what's that protocol look like? Uh, and, you know, what happens if a node fails in the middle of replication? Do you copy somewhere else? Uh, what if a node is slow? Now all of a sudden, I suppose I want three copies, but one of the nodes I've picked is uh, running extremely slowly because it's overloaded, and now my... Uh, my write speed is limited by the slowest node in the system, and that might be really problematic. Um, so in general, when you have multiple replicas, your gets are slow because you're trying to replicate as where, everywhere you can, uh, or excuse me, your puts are slow because you're trying to replicate as many places as you can, but your gets might get faster, uh, no pun intended, because uh, you have multiple copies and you could be served by different nodes. So just to put this on the table here, what do we mean by consistency? Suppose we have uh, the red node is trying to put key 14 with value 14 prime, and the blue node is trying to put uh, value 14 double prime in the system, what happens? Well, they get to the directory in some order, and they, they leave the directory in some order, but uh, perhaps because of uh, network ordering or whatever, what actually happens here is uh, sort of, Red arrives last at node one, but arrives first at node two, uh, node three, and suddenly we've got two different values for key 14 in the system. We've got sort of uh, 14 prime on the one hand and 14 double prime on the other, and uh, we have to worry about how do we keep that consistent. So, because um, if you if you think about this when you go to read. Uh, what do we get for get 14? Well, it's undefined because there's two different options there. So um, there's many consistency models. 
Okay, there's, there are classes you can take where they talk about consistency models in 252. Uh, we talk about uh, cache consistency. In 262, you can talk about all sorts of different distributed systems consistency. Uh, the simplest idea here of atomic consistency uh, is, or linearizability shows up in databases where uh, gets and puts to replicas appears if there was a single underlying system, even though there's many replicas, and uh, there's one image and there's only one uh, updated value uh, at a time. This is like transactions. Um, in, in 252, it's, it's uh, sequential consistency you talk about. Uh, another option here is something called eventual consistency, which is that, uh, well, we don't really know what the absolute latest value is at any given time, but if we let the system stabilize without any writes, they'll all eventually converge to a single up-to-date version, okay? And so while a lot of writes are going on from different people, different readers might get different views of the system, but they are all converging eventually to the same place, okay? Um, and, you know, you might ask yourself what makes sense in this large distributed system. Well, I'll tell you these kind of atomic consistency or sequential consistency or linearizability, these kind of behaviors have a tendency to be uh, very slow and take uh, hard to achieve well in a big distributed system. They work better in centralized systems. Okay. Now the question on the chat here is are most distributed systems eventual consistency? So uh, by and large, distributed systems try to give you a view that's like eventual consistency most of the time. There are some things for which that just isn't sufficient. Uh, you know, for instance, if you were to try to do a, uh, a banking application running on a key value store and you're going to you know, take money out of one account and put money into another account, you really can't afford there to be slop in uh, the amount of money. Okay, and so uh, that gets to be a little bit of problematic, and um, that's why, for instance, that um, you know that you might actually have something like a blockchain algorithm to try to give you a version of consistency, but you still have to wait because there's a you got to wait for the for the chains to stabilize. Now the question here is, does Byzantine agreement help you? And the answer is, well, Byzantine agreement's a decision algorithm that you might use to try to. Uh, to try to run a consistency model. And so um, they're slightly different things, but you could use something like Byzantine commit or uh, two-phase commit to make a decision about the ultimate order in which things are being committed. And by that, you can then put a kind of like a timestamp on there that could give you an idea of what the final order is. Uh, and the only thing that Byzantine agreement is going to give you in that scenario there is it's going to prevent other um, you know, malicious writers from basically screwing up the ability of the system to come to a single consistent state at the end. So Byzantine agreement, you might still have an eventual consistency, but it's a type of consistency where everybody agrees on the final order at which the values are, and it's impossible for a malicious person to, um, to screw up the ordering. So there are many others, causal consistency, sequential consistency, strong consistency, uh, lots of consistencies. In fact, there's inconsistency in the consistency, but that's a whole other story. So well, I'm gonna give you one particular option that tends to show up in some of these distributed algorithms a lot. It's called quorum consensus. And um, the idea here is to improve the put and get performance in the presence of uh, multiple copies. And we're gonna do so in a way that keeps us consistent or gives us a nice strong consistency while at the same time allowing us to not have to wait for every replica. And this is pretty commonly used in uh, big key value stores, okay, like Cassandra and several of these others were some of the first to have it. It's now pretty much everywhere. And the idea is you say that we have n replicas of any key and uh, put basically waits for acknowledgments from at least W replicas and get waits for responses from R replicas. Okay, now put is also gonna have uh, something that lets us differentiate relatively newer writes from older ones and we can use a timestamp uh, that we put on our update before it goes into the system to help us with that. Um, 
but our constraint here of W and R is that W plus R has got to be greater than N. And so uh, why is that? Well, if W plus R is greater than N, that means that if we, we make sure that W replicas have been written and we go to read R replicas, we know uh, that we will get enough up-to-date replicas back that we can always find out what the latest value is, okay? So there's at least one node that contains the update in this scenario. And because we've got timestamps on them, then we can figure out uh, that one node, which one has the, uh, the most up-to-date update. Okay. And why might you use W plus R greater than N plus one? Well, you might do that if you were uh, really interested in making sure that your uh, data was absolutely uh, replicated very widely. The, the reason you might want to have W smaller than n, what that really says is if I've got, suppose I have replicas of size three, three copies everywhere, w is equal to two, what that says is after I've got two uh, x back from two different nodes, I'm going to assume that I'm done and that there's enough in the system so that enough copies in the system so that uh, if r is equal to two as well, if I read and I get back two replies of the three nodes, then I know that at least one of them's got the up-to-date data in it. So this is what quorum means. Okay, so for instance, here we have an example where um, we put n is equal to three, we have w and r equal to two. And so our replica set for K14 is gonna be n1, uh, n3, and n4. Um, actually n1, that's a bug there, that's n3. Uh, let's put a three in there just for you guys, three. Um, and what we're going to say here is that ideally we write all three of these copies, but uh, when we get acts back from two of them, we say that's enough and we're going to go forward. So notice how this has sped us up. We haven't had to wait for that third copy to go on, even though our eventual replica set needs to be three copies of everything. And also because we have uh, R equal two, that means we're going to read from two of our, our nodes and at least one of them is going to come back with the most recent value. And so we know that as long as uh, W plus R is greater than N, that uh, we have a system where we'll always at least see the most up-to-date copy. All right. Um, are there any, cop any questions on that? So uh, what, what is the, let's see. Well, that's a good question. So the question here on the chat is, what if uh, two of these fail, um, and it happens to be the two that I asked, then, uh, then you're in trouble. So you have to pick N to be big enough, N and W to be big enough, so that the, uh, the chance that all the nodes that you're querying uh, fail is, is negligible. Okay, so that's a bit, that's a bit of a um, trade-off there. Uh, I will tell you that a lot of the parameters, if you were to use something like Cassandra or Dynamo or some of the, um, you know, I'm going to call them workhorse uh, algorithms for key value stores in, in, the, in the cloud, they usually, they often use n equal three, w equals two, r equals two, because that works pretty well. Okay. Um, so if n3 returns uh, a value that's, uh, so the question on the chat here is, I think, what if N3 returns a value? Then uh, we have two values here. We would use the timestamp to figure out which one's the latest one. And, uh, and what we know is for a fact that uh, as long as we get back two reads, uh, two nodes will return the reads for us that at least uh, one of those two is going to have the later timestamp and it's going to have the one we're looking for. Good. By the way, I, I mentioned the timestamp when I talk about this because oftentimes these papers don't make it clear that this needs something like a timestamp. Otherwise, you can't really make it work properly. Okay, so um, now let's move on for a moment to scalability. So uh, what if I want to um, use more nodes uh, and I want to serve more requests from nodes in which a, a value is stored in parallel? The master can basically replicate popular values on more nodes, um, and then we can try, try to uh, scale the directory somehow by replicating it or partitioning it or whatever, but this very rapidly gets tricky, and uh, how do we want to do this, okay? And furthermore, the directory, 
It's keeping track of the storage that's available at each node, preferentially inserting new values on nodes with more storage as a way to try to balance the load. Um, and when a new node is added, then what? You can't just insert only new values on the new node because that new node then isn't really taking over the load from the other nodes. So suppose you've got uh, uh, 10 nodes and you add an 11th, you'd like there to be some rebalancing that happens so that um, that new node is, is worthwhile in the short term as well as the long term. And so that rebalancing is something that we would ideally have some algorithm that would let us figure out somehow. So, and then what happens when a node fails? So if we've, you know, we were talking back here when we were looking at this uh, consensus algorithm, if uh, we had three copies and nodes start failing, then not only do we need to avoid the nodes that are failed, but we also have to somehow make sure that the values that they had get re-replicated from other copies so that our net total number of copies is converging toward n which was our choice of three, for instance. Otherwise, uh, you know, nodes can fail and we start losing data after too many nodes fail because nobody has it anymore. So the challenge is the directory contains a bunch of entries equal to the number of key value pairs. Can be tens or hundreds of billions of entries, okay? Um, I feel like uh, the, the cosmologist, uh, Carl Sagan, who used to talk about billions and billions of entries, okay? Billions and billions of stars was his thing. but um, the solution here is something called consistent hashing, and it basically provides a mechanism to divide the key value pairs among the active set of nodes that are currently up, which could be hundreds or thousands or millions of nodes, and do so in a way that automatically adapts as nodes fail and come back in. So that's the consistent hashing algorithm. So it's a little different from the hashing that you've put in when you learned about hash tables in say 61B. Um, it's a little uh, more dynamic. Okay, and the uh, the first time that you see this, uh, it's it's a little tricky to get, but let's see if we can get you guys through this. So we're going to assume for a moment, like I said, that the key space is uh, m bits, and and like 256 is a good number. And so if you think about all of the the values that m bits can represent, it's a lot, right? It's two to the 256, and so um, what we're going to do is we're going to associate a unique ID in a ring uh, of the space zero to two to the m minus one, that's all possible keys of value m, and we're gonna partition that space across n machines. So, so far I haven't said anything too exciting other than that there's a ring that represents all the keys and we're gonna split those keys up to our n machines. So that isn't anything more than the hash uh, pixel location, but it's gonna get more interesting as we start drawing this for a moment. So we're gonna assume that the keys uh, are all in the same space as the nodes. And so each key value is stored at the node with the smallest ID bigger than the key. Okay, so that sounds messy, but it's better with a picture. Okay, so here um, I'm gonna make a much smaller key space. So I'm gonna assume M is six. And so we have 64 total keys. And I've got these nodes are, are around the system and they also have a place in this ring. So every spot in this ring, which is only 64 spots in this small ring, represents a key in the two to the 64 uh, space, or excuse me, in the two to the six bit space. And uh, it also represents the potential for a node. What we do is we, for instance, take a node and maybe take its IP address and some other unique characteristics about it, run the hash function on it, that's gonna give us another key and we're gonna think of that as placing these nodes on this ring. So we've got a node here that's currently at 4, 8, 15, 20, 32, 35, 44, 58. Those are all the nodes. And how do I put them on the ring? Well, I took some unique thing about the node and I hashed it with the same algorithm I've been using with my keys and that puts them on the ring, okay? Everybody with me so far? Now, um, if we now consider uh, moving forward on this a little bit, we can say that if we imagine a key and a key value pair that we wanna put into the system, and I'm gonna put the system in quotes, what we do is we put the key in the node that's the next uh, highest key in the space uh, that's uh, higher than us. So for instance, if we were gonna try to put the, the key 
five into this, we find its successor is node eight. And so node eight is gonna store key five. And we can look down here and we can say, well, if we got key 24, that's gonna get sto stored by node 32, okay? And so um, here's another example, for instance, node 14 with key uh, value 14 is gonna get stored on the server with ID 15, okay? And we can do this because we've taken the unique information about the nodes, we've hashed it uh, with the same hash function that we got the keys from, and therefore we can say for every key, there's always some node that's the next node clockwise in the ring, okay? And in practice, since M is 256 bits or more, this is a really, really, really large ring, okay? And so th there's a lot of space here between each node in the ring and each key in the ring, but the process here is still the same. We store a given key value pair on the th server that is the immediate successor of the key. Now I'm gonna pause there long enough for this to sink in as being probably confusing and wait for a couple of questions. Everybody with me so far? This, this mapping here is consistent hashing, by the way. Sorry, could you just say that last sentence one, one more time? <laughs> well, this, what I've described to you here is consistent hashing, okay? And what it means is it's a way of assigning uh, a key to a server in, uh, in a space where the keys and the server names are, dis are randomly distributed from the, same, uh, from the same key space, okay? Now, um, the question, we have a couple of questions. This is great. So the first question is, how do you know that we don't have one node covering a large portion of the, of the space than others? And the answer is you don't, probabilist you don't know for sure, but probabilistically it's extremely unlikely to happen. Okay, and as you add nodes, the chance of having one node taking a ridiculous amount of the space goes uh, down very rapidly. And if you look at the resources page, I put up a paper on Cord which uh, talks about the consistent hashing properties and, and shows you uh, experimentally why this doesn't tend to happen very much. Now, uh, another question is, is it possible for the number of nodes on the network to change? Yes. So the reason I talk about this algorithm this way is let's suppose that node 15 fails. If node 15 fails, then which node is now um, responsible for uh, key 14? Well, it's now node 20. So the nice thing about this consistent hashing algorithm is it automatically tells you who's responsible for keys as the number of nodes comes and leaves, all right? And the question about the directory, there isn't one right now. The directory is the structure. So this directory uh, is discovered by uh, starting at some known node and going clockwise until you find a space that your key fits in. And at that point, you know that the next successive node is the one that's got your, your uh, item, okay? Now, we have lots of questions about who's tracking all this and so on. And um, you're gonna have to give me a, a few slides to get to that. The meaning of M, there's a question also about what's the meaning of M. Uh, again, so the meaning of M is the number of bits in the key space. So typically that's something like 256, okay? All right. Um, now, what's happening to node 14 in this example? There's no node 14, there's only key 14. So the idea is then, especially if M equals 256, so you, you imagine two to the 256, okay? So your, your brain just uh, kind of blew up because it's really big, right? And imagine a reasonable number of nodes, a thousand, a million, billion, whatever, it doesn't matter. You, you put them randomly on that ring, uh, it's gonna be extremely sparse relative to the possible keys out there. And what's happening in this picture here is there is no node 14, there is a node 15. And so key value pair 14, V14 is stored on server 15. That's all this is showing you, okay? So the distribution uh, node, so notice that there, there's no centralized anything in this picture, all right? All that happened was when we, have a new node to add to the system. We come up with our way of hashing its metadata. So we come up with its uh, name or key or whatever you want to call it. We insert it into the system via some mystery mechanism I haven't told you yet. And it immediately starts taking over 
the keys that it's now uh, that it's now responsible for. And how do we know it's responsible? Well, because it is the immediate successor of some key between its predecessor um, and it. And that's that's um, that's all that consistent hashing is going to tell us. Okay. And uh, when a new node comes in. Yes, what happens is the redistribution of keys, so if 20 has just come in, then uh, we have to redistribute the keys that were being stored on 32, get distributed back on 20 because they're those keys between 15 and 20, inclusive on 20, are now responsible uh, responsibility of 20. And they are copied by the algorithm. OK. Um, all right, are we ready to move forward here? So there's no centralized anything in this. And I haven't shown you anything that uh, will lead you to believe I can build this. All you need to do so far is believe that if I can somehow plop a node onto the ring uh, based on something to do with its name randomly, then, um, and then I can transfer keys uh, to this new node, that's consistent hashing. And certainly those of you who are thinking this through can note that if, uh, I only have one copy of, say, uh, key 14 on server 15, and server 15 just dies. I've just lost key 14. So clearly, there's got to be some replication in here, too. We'll get to that, hopefully, before the lecture's over. All right. So I'm going to move on now. Hopefully, we can do that, and we'll see whether things keep going. So Cord is a distributed uh, lookup service based on the consistent hashing idea. It was originally designed at MIT and at uh, Berkeley. Jan Stoika was one of the original designers of this. Um, I present Cord because it's, it's the simplest of all of these peer-to-peer -peer algorithms. It's the cleanest one. And if you understand it, it basically gives you a great uh, leg up in understanding the other ones. And so that's why I like Cord. And you can, uh, and Gobert's, yes. And you can um, take a look at the uh, Cord paper that I have up on the resources page for you. So important aspect of the design space here is we're going to decouple correctness from efficiency. So in trying to turn this consistent hashing thing that I, this idea I just gave you into an algorithm, I need to figure out what, what I need to implement for correctness and what I need to implement for efficiency. And I got to separate those two. Okay. And cord is particularly clean. All right. Now the other thing about this idea is it's a combined directory and storage space. So I know, I'm going to be able to route to the location of an item, and uh, and it's that item I've been routing toward is going to be stored on the server I eventually get there. So I'm no longer have a separate directory and storage nodes. I now have them combined together. So every one of these things that you see here that I've got that look like computers, they're all a combined chunk of the directory space and chunk of the storage space together in one box. Okay. So the properties for correctness, so every node in the system needs to know about neighbors on the ring. So it needs to know one predecessor and one successor on the ring. And if we do that properly and the ring itself is fully connected, then we've got correctness. Because I can always, as long as I always know who my successor and predecessor is, then if somebody's looking up key 14 and they're on node 4, they know for a fact that wherever uh, key 14 is, it's this way, clockwise on the ring. And so it just goes to its successor. Okay. And then eight says, uh, just goes to its successor. And eventually 15 is going to be the one. And yes, this is one ring to rule them out. Oh, that is correct. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, in this particular scenario, scenario, if there were a bunch of smaller rings that it's ruling, then the thing is inconsistent. It's not working properly. So our correctness property is basically that every node fits in the ring cleanly. Performance, on the other hand, is is got to be something better than that because, in a worst case, suppose I pop into this system at 20 and I'm looking for 14, I got to go da 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 around all the way around before I hit 15. So clearly, the the ring gives me correctness because I can always fall back to it, but I got to do something better. Okay, um, and there's many other of these structured peer-to-peer -peer services. Um, there's one from also from Berkeley called Can. There's Tapestry. That's one I designed way back when with my students. Pastry was one designed uh, at Microsoft. Bamboo also designed with my students here. Kademlia that was designed sort of at uh, NYU slash Stanford. Um, several of them designed at Berkeley. So this is all part of the peer-to-peer -peer space in the early 20, uh, 2000s. Okay. So 
Cord's lookup mechanism is one of routing. And so what we do is every node maintains a pointer to its successor. We route the packet to the node responsible for the idea of what we're looking for. So suppose that node four is trying to find out who's responsible for 37. Okay, so node four starts a query. It doesn't know anything about it. So it asks its successor who has asked its successor who has its successor and so on around the ring. And then eventually, uh, Node 35 knows that its successor is 44. And so at that point, it knows that 44 is going to hold 37. So it can just respond to the query at that point and says, well, Node 4, if you're interested, uh, you want to talk to Node 44. And by the way, since 35 has a pointer to it, like an IP address, it can also be telling Node 4 basically what the IP address is to talk to Node 44. OK. So this is routing. And by the way, the earlier part of the lecture, uh, before my mouse went haywire, you can see that this is a recursive query process, right? We could do this uh, iteratively, where 4 asks 8, 8 returns something, then 4 asks 15, 15 returns something, et cetera. Okay? And probabilistically, the iterative one is going to uh, be about a factor of 2, probabilistically longer than the recursive one. So worst case lookup here is order n where I have to go all the way around the, the ring. So that's uh, not great. So we're going to need a dynamic performance optimization to make this work somehow. All right. And uh, hopefully, you guys will give me a little time after uh, the clo normal close of class here so we can uh, get through this, because we lost about 10 minutes in my little uh, my, uh, mouse snafu. So what does this really mean? Okay, And keep in mind that the nodes on the ring are uh, nodes that we've taken their IP address and we've hashed it, maybe some metadata, to get our position on the rings. That means that four and eight are absolutely not close to each other in the network. In fact, they're uh, anti-close, if that makes any sense, right? So because four's IP address and eight's IP address are hashed, if they happen to be in the same network, um, it's more likely that you'll get four out of one and 32 at the other than you'll get eight, okay? And so what this really means is if I actually look at say the US, and I look at where all these nodes are, what I see here is here's node 4, node 8, node 15, et cetera. And so my ring is really mapped uh, in a pretty random looking process around uh, wherever those nodes are. And here I'm showing you North America. Uh, this is potentially good because it says, uh, first of all, it doesn't give you speed from a locality standpoint, obviously. But what it does give you is that if I replicate key 4, on a couple of successive nodes, then I'll get geographic separation and it'll be less likely that a, a local disaster will take out my data. So this is this anti-locality property of cord is actually a feature. Okay. And so here's an example. Um, you know, here's uh, node 14, and uh, each of these uh, or key 14, excuse me, each of the clients that might be using my network knows about one, typically one node. And that one node is the one that they enter into before they run the protocol. OK. So now the question is, how do we make the ring work? And the answer is, there's a stabilization protocol that's very simple. So I haven't given you fast yet, so we're going to make correctness. And the idea here is basically that we run stabilized periodically, where uh, a given node um, asks, given node n says, well, who's uh, take who I think my successor is, and ask who they think their predecessor is. And it turns out that if the successor dot predecessor, so this is sending a message, isn't me, then, uh, then that node doesn't know about me. And at which point, I've got to tie myself in to the ring uh, and make sure they think of me as a predecessor. Okay, And so um, and, and uh, if I've changed something, I also go ahead to my successor and I notify them and say, hey, I'm here, remember me. And at that point, the, this is the successor um, gets a notification and says, oh, if my, either my predecessor is nil, so I don't know of anybody, or um, this new guy who talked to me is actually between where I thought my predecessor was and me, then I'll call him my predecessor. And this algorithm, once you get kind of what's going on, uh, converges constantly, all right? It's a constant convergence sort of thing so that as new nodes come and go, it uh, keeps the ring connected. So here's a good example. So for instance, a node with ID 50 is sitting over here, unconnected to anybody. Notice its successor is uh, nil and its predecessor is nil. 
and assume that it only knows about node 15 as an entry point, the question is, how does it join? Well, what it does is it first sends a join request to the uh, node that it knows about. And what's interesting about this protocol is the join request is exactly like a lookup. So what we're doing with node 15 is we're asking node 15 to tell us where would key 50 live in the network? And you can see that key 50 would live on key, it would live on server 58. So as we go through this routing process, we find out that node 58 would actually store key 50, which means uh, how does node 50 know where node 15 is? It doesn't have to, right? So that's the thing. Notice that um, what's happened. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The way that node uh, 50 knows about 15 is that you have to know one node in the system. It doesn't matter which one you know. Maybe you get it through DNS. Maybe you get it through some name service that tells you about how to get into the ring. But you need to know at least one. Um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get to the uh, failure in a second. Hold on a second here. So um, so basically, node 50 consulted its how do I get a hold of the ring name service and was told about 15. And it asks now 15, where would key 50 get stored? And what comes back is stored on 58, at which point we set that to our successor because we know that if uh, we were key 50 and we would be stored on node 58, then our successor ought to be 58, okay? And now we go through the stabilization process where we look up, uh, we ask our successor now, our new successor, who its predecessor is, and it says, well, my predecessor is 44. Okay, and at that point, we know for a fact that uh, really 58's predecessor ought to be 50, not 44. And so when we go through this, um, node 50 says, hey, node 44, excuse me, hey, node 58, you ought to use me. Okay, and so it goes through the algorithm. Now its predecessor is set. Okay, and so at this point, we have a partially connected ring, and if we, have everybody continue to run stabilize. Now our local node runs stabilize, okay? And other nodes know stabilize. And notice what happens here when 44 runs stabilize, it asks its successor who its predecessor is. And that successor says, well, my predecessor is 50. And now 44 knows something funny is going on because it doesn't know about 50. And so now at that point, it connects itself, okay? And if you were to now follow this through, you would see that this converges to connecting. Okay, so that's what's cool about this algorithm. It's, it's automatically, if you just keep running it uh, over and over again, it will converge. Now, two interesting things here, one of which was a question that was just asked, is it possible for a consistency problem to occur if some queries partway through this joining process uh, and uh, you have nodes joining? The answer is that uh, you always know when you get a response for a, for a query, you always know whether it was successful or not. So what's gonna happen when new nodes are joining and your query happens to cross through them is that you, uh, you retry and, and it'll work the second time through, okay? So um, 44 only knows about 50 when it calls stabilize, that's correct. So basically what's happening here is if you, everybody's running the stabilize procedure and notifying their successors, then the ring will join up and it will continue to join uh, over time. Okay. Now there was another interesting question. Um, so 44 knows about 50 when it uh, when it calls uh, uh, stabilize, and uh, and then it gets then it notifies um, it notifies 50 that it's choosing it as the uh, successor at that point. Okay. So I, I challenge everybody to take a look through the slides afterwards. It, it's pretty cool how simple this algorithm is. Now. Um, the other question that was up here, I wanted to answer this is, what happens if a node fails? So if a node fails, what will happen is that um, as long as only one node fails, this particular algorithm will rejoin the ring. If more than one node fails that are and close to each other simultaneously, then the ring will get disconnected. And so the, what that requires then is what we do is we have what's called a leaf set, where rather than one successor, we keep track of a few forward and backward ones and then uh, becomes probabilistically very uh, hard for the ring to be un, um, unformed here. Okay. Why does node 50 join and then stabilize but not node 44 is a question. So node 44 was already part of the ring in that example I showed you. And so it's only node 50 
that's uh, doing the joining process. And node 44 thinks it's happily connected to 58. And so what happens is 50 gets itself partially in the ring. And at that point, the stabilization then reconnects the ring, like a, almost like a rubber band or something. OK. So how do we make this whole thing fast? So the answer of making this fast is like the following, and I'm not going to go through this in great detail because we're already a little past our original time. I'm hoping you guys give me a little extra time. And the idea here is that we have what's called a finger table. And so um, each node doesn't just keep track of its successors and predecessors. What it does is it finds probabilistically a node that is uh, half ac halfway across the ring, a quarter of the way, an eighth of the way, and so on across the ring. And those are called fingers. And so what that means is, for instance, the node that's halfway across this, which is my node number 80 plus 2 to the 6th mod to the 7th is halfway. And what that is is 16. And so the node that this finger points to is node 20 in that case. And there's, a, there's an algorithm that's also like the stabilization one I just showed you that figures out each of these fingers. And now, if a query comes into a node, let's so, say that node 80, somebody asked node 80 to find uh, something like uh, key 31. What 80 does is rather than going serially all the way around the ring, the first thing it does is it takes the longest finger it can to get to node 20. And then node 20 knows exactly where to go. So you can get this with the good fingers. You could get to node uh, 21 in, in two hops. Okay, And these fingers are continuously refreshed via a dynamic algorithm. If some of them are bad because the node they were pointing to went away and it hasn't been refreshed yet, it's OK, because I can always fall back on to the linearly going through the ring. OK, so this is, a cons this is a performance instead of a consistency issue. So the consistency issue is keep the ring always connected. That's through our joining operation. The, the performance or efficiency is by keeping the finger tables mostly working. And that lets me basically go uh, halfway across the ring, then a quarter, and so on, to very quickly converge on my node in logarithmic number of steps rather than uh, a linear number of steps. OK. So now, uh, how do we get fault tolerance for the lookup service? Well, uh, so explaining this a little bit again. So what you see here, uh, this was a question on the chat, says the following. If, first of all, everybody hopefully agrees with me that once I have my successor and predecessors uh, figured out, I can always query by going around the ring. Okay, I can always find where I need to go by going around the ring. So that's a correctness, but not it's it's correct, but not fast. The way I make this fast is I have this finger table, which represents a pointer rather than just successors and predecessors. It points to uh, a pointer all the way across the ring, uh, one that's a quarter of the way, one that's an eighth of the way, and so on. And um, it's always trend, it's always uh, gone forward, okay. And I'm not sure uh, what the question is about finger table traverse linearly backwards. So the answer is I'm trying to go clockwise around this. And if I'm, if I'm going somewhere uh, past halfway, what I do is I start by going all the way across the ring. And then 20s finger tables will take me a quarter of the way and so on. So I'm always going forward. OK? The reason I've got uh, the finger table is how I get an order log m routing, OK? It's a, or, um, because I basically have the ability to um, think of this as bit correction. If I look at where I'm at and the key I'm trying to get to, I first correct the first bit, then the second bit, then the third bit, and so on. OK. All right. Now, how do we get fault tolerance? Well, uh, for one thing, we need to have more than um, more predecessors and successors than just one, and that lets us keep the ring connected. Um, if k's log m lookup operations works with high probability, um, even if half the nodes fail, uh, we can make this work um, where k is the, the number of, of successors and predecessors I keep track of. And again, that paper that I put up there will tell you about it. Um, but replication is also necessary. So for instance, rather than just keeping uh, key 14 stored on uh, server 15, I also serve it in my replica set moving forward. So here I have my three copies. And as a result, if, say, node 20 fails, then I, I still have my new leaf set of 15 now is 15, 32, and 35. And both 15 and 32 still have a copy of key 14. And so now I can re-replicate it on 35. 
okay? And um, the question also here is, how does a host's finger table get updated when a new host joins? And the answer is, fairly simply, what it really means is that uh, periodically, I just go through all my fingers, and what I say is I take my name and I add two to the m uh, to it, uh, to the m minus one, and I ask it basically to route me to there, and that gives me back the current live uh, version of halfway across. And so as and I go over time, I go through uh, to, to um, find all the fingers. The drawback of this is that there's constant uh, traffic to keep the ring live, okay? But it does route you in log m steps, which is kind of nice. Okay, so I'm running out of time here. Um, so I talked to you about fault tolerance. So the idea here is that if uh, this is my leaf set, um, say k equals three forward. Now, if a node fails, then uh, then my leaf set still has two other nodes, and they can replicate forward. And so that's what the uh, this chord algorithm does: is when a node fails, it has enough replicas to move forward. Okay. And if no, and I just said that basically, if node fifteen fails, I replicate forward. Okay, etc. All right. Um, so replication in physical space, I mentioned this earlier. So 15, 20, 32 has actually got geographic spread. And if, these, uh, if this ring is spread around the planet, uh, I'm all over the place, okay, now. Okay, so um, finally, I wanted to say that Amazon, here, please uh, ter turn off the annotation if you could. So uh, Dynamo basically um, is a version of the cords uh, ring that works internally. Um, and it's Amazon storage for, um, for its internal process. And so if you look here, you see um, we have actual cord rings that are buried behind several uh, routing prop, uh, routing boxes inside of Amazon. And, uh, but that's how they store all of their things like their, uh, their shopping carts and, and uh, all of the information that you query gets stored in Dynamo. And the application uh, can deliver functionality in bounding time. So what's interesting about the Dynamo paper, which I also posted relative to the cord paper, is the dynamo paper figures out how to have a uh, number of nines of uh, service level agreement that says that you'll get your data returned uh, no later than x, whereas cord, as originally defined probabilistically, doesn't quite have that properly. Okay, and so they, for instance, can have service guarantees that'll provide a response within 300 milliseconds for 99.9% .9 of its requests. Okay, all right. So I think that's all I wanted to say for today. So in summary, in conclusion, we talked about distributed file systems. We started with what I'd call traditional ones like NFS and AFS, trying to give you transparent access of files that are stored all over the place on remote disks. There's some cache for performance, excuse me, that, that that causes uh, consistency issues. We talked about VFS, the virtual file system layer. Um, and that we talked about that mostly last time, which basically allows us to plug these systems in and, and we can use them locally as if they were uh, local. And then we talked about cache consistency. Um, we then talked about how, to, how key value stores are somewhat simpler and easier to scale. Um, and we talked about challenges in terms of fault tolerance, scalability, and consistency. And I presented the CORD algorithm, which is a highly distributed uh, lookup protocol. And I hope if you actually internalize CORD, and I strongly suggest you guys do, it will give you a leg up in understanding all these other protocols, right? And the last thing I did want to mention, I didn't say it on the slide uh, when I was showing replication, is that that quorum consistency idea where I, I store, I wait for R uh, reads to come back or W writes, and I have N replicas applies to cord as well. And that's exactly what DynamoDB has that kind of replication to it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. So, uh, thanks for uh, bearing with me for uh, the little disaster I had earlier with my mouse. I'm still not sure what happened. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to miss you guys. It's been a little weird. I haven't actually gotten to see you in a month and a half or two months. Um, there was a question here about elaborating a little bit about uh, what material will be on the midterm. Um, pretty much the chance is that uh, things that were talked about today are may show up uh, on the midterm, but they're not gonna be as highly weighted as earlier things. So um, I hope you all have uh, a great uh, couple of days. Good luck on the midterm. Uh, we'll be giving you details about how to take the midterm in a bit. And uh, don't forget to fill out your uh, 
HKN forms. Um, that's a very important part of the process. Uh, you can say what you liked and didn't like about the class. And, uh, and the final is midterm three. There's no final. But uh, hopefully, by the way, just as a heads up, hopefully you guys can all access Google Forms because the midterm is going to be with Google Forms. So um, you might want to make sure for those of you that might be in foreign countries that you have a VPN set up or something going. All right. Ciao. Give everybody, uh, everybody give the TAs uh, a clap as well uh, virtually because they've been great. Ciao. And uh, look me up if you're still around next fall. Um, and we're actually physically present. Come say hi to me because it's been a little lonely without you guys. All right. Bye.